Good morning, church family. It is great to be here and so great to see everyone out this morning. Uh, I just do not want to break up the good, friendly fellowship that I hear going on, but uh, it is about time for us to begin our Bible class. And looking forward to the Bible class this morning, I want to thank so very much Brother Dalton for filling in while I was away and having the opportunity to spend time with my family. And uh, but it is it was great to go, but it's even greater to come back and uh, to be able to hear this this uh, fellowship and to be able to to see your smiling faces. I want to just stand here for a few moments and and look at you, but uh, that will take away from our Bible class. And uh, so uh, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we will get into our Bible class and. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother David Sessions, if he would, to come and lead us in a prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Let us pray. Most kind, gracious God, thank you for our blessed Savior. Thank you for this church. Bless this church. Help us to be more like you. Help us to grow in your word. Thank you for David's safe return. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> amen. Appreciate so very much that prayer. We are involved, of course, on Sunday morning, a study of the life of Christ, and we are nearing the end of that study. There will be a few more lessons, uh, but nevertheless, we are going to continue on our journey this morning. The last study that we did, which was two weeks ago, we talked about the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. And I think it's very important that when we think about Jesus and we think about what he went through, and, and especially when we think about Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, where the Bible says that, that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the infirmities that with which we are touched, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Sometimes when we look at that verse, I'm not certain if even any of us really grasp everything that Jesus went through. Lord willing, in our time together next week, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And that was probably the most, no, not probably, it was the most horrifying, insulting death that an individual could ever experience. And the one who went through it all was Jesus Christ. And the reason that he did it was for you and me, so that we could have a home in heaven with God someday. And so when you look at these lessons that we have been looking at, if there is one purpose that we can apply to them, it's to cause us to truly, to truly from the very bottom and depths of our hearts, to appreciate what Jesus did for you and for me, he didn't just come and die on the cross. He came and he lived a perfect life, showing us how to live. And he lived a life in such a manner that when he was treated cruelly, he taught us how you and I should respond when we too are treated cruelly in this life. And so in our time together this morning, what I want us to reflect upon is the trials that Jesus went through. Now, the reason that I would say trials of Jesus is because when we read and study the Bible, there are two different kinds of trials that Jesus experienced. Jesus experienced both religious trials and he experienced civil trials. Not just one religious trial and not just one civil trial, but he experienced three religious trials and then three civil trials. And we might ask ourselves the question, why is it that Jesus had to go through all of these trials? And we'll answer that as we continue on. But what I want you to think about is we think of these trials. I mean, you can't hardly turn on the news. You can't, um, when I open up my internet screen, when I'm about to study and work on a lesson or something like that, or, or check my email, or you pick up the newspaper, there is always some kind of trial that is taking place all across America. And when you think about trials that take place in our world today, many of them are unfair. Many of them are unjust. On many occasions, individuals who are innocent, individuals 
who have never committed the crime itself. They are convicted and they are sent to prison. And so when you think about trials that go on in our world today, many of them receive an unfair condition or an unfair judgment. But brothers and sisters in Christ, never has there been an unjust and an unfair trial as was the one that Jesus himself experienced. And so therefore, I want us to think about this trial or these trials that Jesus experienced before he was led to Calvary and before he was crucified. I want to begin, first of all, with the religious side of the trials, and then we will move to the civil trials. And when you think about the religious side of the trials that Jesus experienced, there were three. To begin with, the Bible teaches us that he was taken before Annas. Secondly, he was taken before Caiaphas. And third, the Bible teaches us that he was taken before the Sanhedrin Council. Now, the Sanhedrin Council was made up of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, the high priests, the chief priests, a whole conglomeration of individuals. It was 70 different men that made up what was known as the Sanhedrin Council. And Jesus had to go before each one of these individuals. Let's begin, first of all, if you will, by Jesus being before Annas. Now, there are many different passages. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all four talk about Jesus and his trials. And we will not have time to look at every single account. But what I want us to do is try to ping pong back and forth and try to get an a bird's eye view of what Jesus experienced in each one of these trials. To begin with, when we think about Annas, Annas was not the high priest at the time. Even though many people, or any, even though the passage of Scripture teach us that he was the high priest. Annas served as high priest from about 7 until 14 AD. Now you've got to keep in mind that this is some time when Jesus is put on trial and he is crucified this is sometime between 30 and 33 A.D. And so clearly Annas is not the high priest. But the scriptures lead us to believe sometimes that he is. For example, look at Luke chapter 3 in verse 2. Go to the book of Luke chapter 3. And I want you to just plainly look at verse 2. The Bible says, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Now note, if you will, that this passage says that both Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Now what's wrong with that? You can only have one high priest. But yet the scriptures say that both Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. And that's not the only place that you will see that. Look with me, if you will, to the book of Acts chapter 4 in verse 6. Look at Acts chapter 4. And I want you to note verse 6 there. The Bible says, we'll really begin in verse 5, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, there's the Sanhedrin council, brothers and sisters, their, their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, and look what we got, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Now again, you've got Annas being recognized as the high priest right along beside who? Beside Caiaphas, who was at this time the high priest. So how do you explain it? Well, if you'll look closely, this verse kind of leads us to the idea. It says, as were of the family of what? Of the high priest. Now, Go in with me, if you will, to John's account. If we will go to John's account, John explains it to us. Go to John chapter 18, and there I want you to note verses 12 and 13. Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was, now look at it, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, watch what it says, who was the high priest that year. Okay? So what's the solution? What's the answer to this problem in Scripture? It's not a contradiction. But rather, brothers and sisters, what it's doing is it's just simply pointing out the tremendous influence 
that Annas had, number one, because he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, and number two, because he was part of that priestly family. It's a lot like a president. Even though Trump is no longer president, what do they still refer to him as, President Trump? Even though Obama is no longer president, what do they refer to him as, President Obama? Even though Bush is no longer president, what do they, how do they continue to refer to all of these people as a president, even though they are not? So what do we gain from that? It's because of their influence. It's because of the term that they serve and because of the influence that they put forth, they are still recognized as a president, even though they are not serving in that term. And I would suggest and tell you that is the very same thing that you've got going on here. Why is it that they go to Annas first? Is because he is an extremely powerful individual, no doubt with tremendous influence, and therefore they take Jesus to Annas. Now, what happens as Jesus is before Annas? Well, let's read, if you will, in the book of John chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, and look at what the Bible says. And Simon Peter followed Jesus... And so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the court for the courtyard of the high priest. Then Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to, the, to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Who is this other disciple? <laughs> who do you think? I believe that's John. I mean, if you look at that phrase, the other disciple, John, the book of John is an anonymous book. John does not just come right out and say that I, John, wrote this book. He's just kind of, well, he's not kind of, he's very humble. He's an individual with great humility, even though in the book of Revelation, he identifies himself as John. Throughout the book of John, he identifies himself as the other disciple. And so this is John. If you remember the trio, it was Peter, James, and who else? John. And so you've got Peter and John who are very close friends. If you remember the one who leaned upon the Lord's breast during the supper, who was it? It was that disciple that he loved. That's none other than John. And so John is familiar and he is friends and he is known to the high priest. And he is able to go in. And he goes and he makes sure that Peter gets to come in. Now most of the time when we read about the denial of Christ, it's always in that one, two, three form. But what John does, and that's the reason that I wanted to go here, is John lets us know that it didn't just happen just like that, but rather he first denied Jesus when he is before Annas. And then it would be two more times as he would be before Caiaphas. But note, if you will, in verse 17, then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And what did Peter do? I am not. And then in verse 18, now the servants and the officers who made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And where is Peter? He's standing right there with those people. And so this is the very beginning of the denial of, of, of Jesus Christ. And I want you to note where Jesus, where Peter is when he begins to deny Jesus. He is around people. He is surrounded by people who do not know Christ. What does that teach us, brothers and sisters? When you surround yourselves by people of the world, you are more tempted to do that which is wrong. That's what happened with Peter. Tell me that this influence right here did not contribute to him saying, I don't know who he is. However, if he had been completely surrounded by the disciples, as he was when they came to arrest Jesus, what did he do? He pulled his sword and he's ready to kill these people. But now he's not surrounded by the disciples. Now he's surrounded by individuals who are unbelievers. And what does he do? He changes the tune that he sings. And it shows us the great power of influence. It would be also in this particular setting wherein an officer would strike Jesus with the palm of his hand. Look at verse 22. And when he had said these things, one of the officers 
who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? I want you to think about striking Jesus with the palm of your hand. The phrase striking literally means to give to the face the hand. That's the literal translation. If you were translating it from the original language to English, it would be to give the hand to the face. Now, there's a difference between a little slap and when you draw back and you give the hand to the face, you make a connection so hard that that individual feels as if your hand is connected to their face. And that's the way that Jesus was treated. He was literally slapped. For what purpose? For what reason? None other than because of the simple fact that he admitted that he was the son of the living God. It was from this point that the Bible teaches us that Annas would send Jesus, verse 24 of this context, then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, now note what it says, the high priest, which leads us to understand why you've got both Annas once again and Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas was the high priest. Annas was not. He was just a very powerful influence at the time. Following the trial before Annas, then there was the trial before Caiaphas. And what happened as Jesus was before Caiaphas? When we think about Caiaphas, I think it's important that we stop and think about, number one, who he was. We've already seen that he was the son-in-law of Annas. Caiaphas, according to history, served somewhere between 18 and 37 AD, which would have meant that he was the one who was alive and well when Jesus was crucified. And not only that, but you've got him reigning as high priest even almost seven years into the establishment of the church. In fact, we saw in Acts chapter 4 a moment ago that the Bible spoke of Annas who was still living and also who else? It was Caiaphas who was a part of that Sanhedrin council when um Peter and James were and Peter and John were standing before them because they had healed a man back in Acts chapter 3. And so you've got these this very man who put Jesus to death or put his stamp of approval upon putting Jesus to death. And you've got this very same man who is putting his stamp of approval upon the persecution of the saints. What does that teach us? Even the death of Jesus Christ himself did not change this man's heart. What does that teach us today? Brothers and sisters in Christ, there are some people, regardless of what you and I do in life, their heart is set, their heart is hardened, and they're not going to change. That doesn't mean that we give up. It doesn't mean that we quit. But we need to understand that there are some people who are just like Caiaphas in this world and in us. The Bible teaches us, as we've already seen in, the, in John chapter 18 and verse 13, that he was the son-in-law of Annas. Now, the thing about Caiaphas that I found so interesting in thinking about this is Caiaphas was the individual who planted the thought within the religious leaders, that Sanhedrin council, to have Jesus put to death. And you can see that in chapter 18 and verse 14 of the book of John, if you are still there. The Bible says, Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now when did Caiaphas do this? Well, if we were to take the time to go back into chapter 11 of the book of John, you will see it. In John chapter 11, beginning in verse 45, note what the Bible says. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Now verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council. What was that council? Brothers and sisters, that's the Sanhedrin council right there. They gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? What was the purpose of the signs and the miracles that Jesus did? John tells us they were designed to cause us to believe. John 20, 30, and 31. Why didn't it cause these people to believe? For the very same reason that many people will open up this book and they will read it and they will study it and they don't believe. Their hearts just harden, and they choose not to do so. But the Bible teaches us that they came together and they said, He does many signs in verse 48. If we let him alone like this, 
Everyone will believe in him. Praise God for that. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Is that not? You see what's going on here? They are more interested in the physical than they are in the spiritual. They wanted their place, their position in life. They wanted their nation more so than they wanted their place in heaven. A place with God. And one of them, Caiaphas, there he is, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say of his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Isn't it interesting how things work together? Even though he comes up with this plan, Caiaphas is the one who plants the seed and says, look, we've got to put this man to death. It was already a part of prophecy. When Jesus came to the earth, he knew he was going to die. Did he not? You remember the garden and how that he was in agony and he was in pain and literally sweating blood? Why was he doing that? Because he could look ahead. He already knew what was going to happen. And so Caiaphas, even though he planned out the death of Jesus Christ himself, understand that it was a part of prophecy. And he didn't do anything according to the Scriptures that was without the authority of God himself. It would also be that here that Jesus would stand before the Sanhedrin council and he would experience false accusations. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Let's go over to Matthew's account for just a moment. And let's look at verses uh, chapter 26. And I want you to begin reading with me about verse 57. In verse 57, the Bible says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have have, have what further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Look at what they accuse Jesus of. They, ha they can't find anything wrong with him. They bring all of these witnesses and not one can prove any accusation against him. And so what do they have to do? They have to resort to false accusations. And they have to resort to blasphemy, which was something that Jesus had never done. Remember that the Scriptures teach us that Jesus was without sin. Never ever in His life did He ever commit a sin. In fact, in John's account, John would ask the religious leaders, which of you can convince me of sin? Which one? Point it out. He put His life on display. And not a one could convict Him of sin. But they brought false accusations against him. It would also be here that the soldiers would begin to treat Jesus cruelly. Look at verse 67. Then they spat in his face and they beat him and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us Christ, who is the one who struck you? I want you to know first of all that the Bible says that they spat, which literally means they spit, in his face. I want you to note that the Bible says that they beat him, and this is literally to strike with the clenched 
fist. And then the Bible says that they slapped him. Now I want you to note that all three of these words are in what is known as the aorist tense, which means this is something they kept on doing. They hit him with their fist and they spat on him over and over again and they slapped him over and over again. They blindfolded him and said, who is, who is hitting you? Who's spitting on you? Who's slapping you? Prophesy to us. Let us know. What did he do to deserve any of that? What did he do? Nothing. Why did he go through it? For you and for me. When you think about the spitting and the slapping and the beating, all of those were things which would you would do to someone who was a criminal. Someone who was who was utterly and completely guilty of horrible crimes. And Jesus was not guilty of anything. But you and I were, weren't we? What were we guilty of? The most horrible crime in the world, and that's sin. And Jesus experienced all of this, something that you and I deserve because of our sin against God. And He took it for us makes you really appreciate what Isaiah said about Jesus. By His stripes, by His wounds, you and I were healed. Everything that He went through, He did it for you and for me. He went there in our place. <clears throat> it was also here that, G that uh, Peter would continue his denial of Jesus. We already saw that in John's account that Peter would begin to deny Jesus before Annas. Now in Matthew's account, Matthew lists all three of the denials. And we're going to read about them, but, but just keep in mind that those denials actually began before Annas. And then two more of them would have continued before Caiaphas. In verse 69, the Bible says, Now Peter sat in the court, and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. Denial number one. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, saying, I do not know him. He swore, I don't know this man. And a little later, those who stood by, came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them. Your speech betrays you. In other words, you talk like them. And what does Peter do? Then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And the Bible says, And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him before the rooster crows, You will deny me three times. So he went out and he wept bitterly. Now in this third denial, Matthew does a good job, a great job, much better than what I would do. But Matthew does a great job of describing to us the condition of Peter. Matthew says that when Peter had denied the Lord the third time, that the rooster crowed, and immediately Peter remembered the words that Jesus had said to him. You see, Peter had already been told by Jesus you're going to deny me three times. Do you remember what Peter said? Oh, I'll die with you, but I won't ever deny you. Luke adds something to this text, and I want you to look at it with me before we move on. Go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 22 and verse 61. Luke chapter 22, and I want you to look at verse 61 with me. <clears throat> We'll really begin in verse 60. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Now look at verse 61. Don't miss it. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. It was more than just Peter remembering I want you to try to put yourself there. Here's Peter. He denies the Lord once. He denies the Lord twice. And he denies the Lord the third time. And at that moment, what happens? 
the eyes of the Lord and the eyes of Peter meet. And it's then that he remembers what he had said. And then he goes out and he weeps bitterly. How can we apply that to us today? You realize that every time you and I sin, every time in this life that you and I deny the Lord, if we could only imagine Him looking upon us and we could meet Him eye to eye, you know what we would do? We'd go out and we'd weep bitterly. You understand why Peter went out and wept bitterly? It wasn't just because of the fact that he remembered, but he made eye contact with the Lord. Then he went out and he wept bitterly. As we continue on in our study, the, the next religious trial that you have of Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. He goes before Annas. He goes before Caiaphas. Now he goes before the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin, when we ask ourselves, what, what were they like? If there was a comparison that I could make, that would be much like the Supreme Court of our day. They were the ones who made the final decision. Yes, the high priest could make a decision. Annas was very powerful. He was a great influence. Caiaphas was very powerful. He was a great influence. But they could not make decisions on their own. It had to come from the Sanhedrin council. And so these individuals came together. And I want you to go to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 26. And let's read about this account. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning... In verse 57, if you will, the Bible says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed at a distance to the priest's courtyard, and he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. Here you can see that Sanhedrin council. It was made up of the high priests, the scribes. It was made up of the chief priests, the rulers, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the lawyers. All of these individuals made up the Sanhedrin council. And it was here that Jesus was formally condemned. And, and why is it that he was condemned? Was it because of something that he had done? Absolutely not but rather everything that they used to condemn him with was none, none other than a false testimony. In fact, I want you to look at Luke's account before we go any further, before we go into the civil trials. Go to Luke chapter 22, and I want you to look beginning in verse 66 with me. Look at Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 66. And, and note, if you will, the Bible says in verse 66, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the scribes, came together and led him into their council. There's that Sanhedrin council again. And look at what they do. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said, if I, uh, but he said to them, if I tell you, will by no means, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, "You Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it in our own selves, with our own selves, from his own mouth. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And so when you think about the Sanhedrin council, they are the ones who formally conclude that Jesus is worthy of death. Now comes the civil trial. Why was there a need for the civil trials that Jesus would experience? The Jews could condemn a man. They could condemn a man to death, but they did not have the power, nor did they have the authority to put the individual to death. Under the Old Testament law, they could stone an individual if he was guilty of sin, but they are not living by that Old Testament law. They're living by Roman law. And yes, they are still striving to practice their Old Testament laws, but the Roman law is that which ruled, and they, therefore they could not do anything uh, without the Romans approving of it. And so therefore there was the need for the civil trials to be to take place. And so when we think about the civil trials of Jesus, Jesus experienced three of those. Just like there were three religious, 
before Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. You've got three trials that Jesus goes through, which were civil trials. It would begin with Pilate. It would go to Herod. And then third, it would come back to Pilate. Let's begin first of all with Jesus before Pilate. As we think about Jesus before Pilate, you can see that in verse 1 of Luke chapter 23, if you're still there. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And when you think about Jesus being before Pilate, what happens here? Look at verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself, is a Christ, is a king. And then again in verse 5, look at what they say. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now look at the false accusations they bring against Jesus. Number one, they say that he was guilty of perverting the nation. Was that true? Absolutely not. They say that he was guilty of forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Was that true? Absolutely not. They say that he was guilty of stirring up the people. Was that true? Absolutely not. The only thing that is spoken of Jesus here that was true is that He was a king. And brothers and sisters, He was a king then, and He's still a king today. Death did not keep Him from being a king. Because He was the king, because He was Lord and Savior, He was resurrected from the grave. And right now, as we've already seen, He's sitting at the very right hand of God. And I want you to know what the Bible teaches us as he is before Pilate. The Bible says that Pilate found no fault with him. Look at verse 4. So Pilate said to the chief priest and to the crowd, I find no fault with this man. And that's not the only time that you're going to see Pilate do that. Pilate is going to do it two more times. But when Pilate examines him, he learns that he is not guilty of anything. And so what does he do? He passes the buck. It's very interesting that later on in the text that Jesus would be that Herod would say, that uh, Pilate would say to Jesus, "Don't you know that I have the power to free you, or I have the power to crucify you?" Now, brothers and sisters, understand the power in that statement. Pilate could have freed Jesus; he sought to do so, but once again, because of the influence of the people, what did he choose to do? He chose to have Jesus crucified. Again, you see that great power of influence, don't you? But Jesus found, uh, Pilate found no fault with Jesus. Now the parallel passages to this account are found in Matthew chapter 27, 11 through 14, Mark chapter 15, 2 and 5, and John chapter 18, verses 28 through 38. I wish we had time to go through each one of these accounts because each one tell us a little something different that happened during Jesus' first trial before Pilate. Well, one of the things that, that I'm amazed by when I look at the trial of Jesus is Matthew and Mark's account. They both say that Pilate marveled at Jesus. In other words, he was in complete awe of Jesus, yet he did not obey. I can be an individual who lives my life in awe of Jesus. I just had the opportunity to go this past couple of weeks and look at God's beautiful creation and I was in complete awe. But there are many people who will look at the awe of Jesus and marvel at Jesus, but they still won't be obedient. It's not enough. It is for you and me because we're believers. But for some people, just like Pilate, an individual whose heart was hardened, it's not enough for those individuals. After Pilate passes the buck and sends uh, Jesus to Herod, the Bible teaches us, and I want you to go to Luke's account if you'll note here if you're still there. The Bible teaches us that Herod was glad to see Jesus. And I'm going to try to rush through this because we're running out of time. But the Bible teaches us that Herod was glad to see Jesus in verse 8. But it's not glad in the sense that you and I would be glad. You know, when the Lord comes back, for those of us who are faithful Christians, it's going to be a happy, a joyous time. We're going to look in the clouds and we're going to be glad that our Lord and Savior has come. But Herod's not glad to see Jesus in this sense. You see, the only reason he wants to see Jesus 
And so maybe he can see some sign or miracle that Jesus performed. He wasn't happy to see him in the sense of knowing salvation. He wasn't happy in the sense of seeing him in order to have heaven as his home. He was happy to see him in order that perhaps he could perform a miracle. In verse 10, the Bible teaches us that Jesus was continually accused before those religious leaders, vehemently accused, the Bible says, with a very harsh and loud manner. The Bible goes on to say that in verses 11 through 12 that he was treated with contempt, that he was mocked, and he was arrayed with a gorgeous robe. Contempt. What does that word contempt there mean? It literally means to ridicule. It means to look down upon. Have you ever been ridiculed because of who you are? Have you ever been looked down upon because of who you are? Folks, we don't understand ridicule. We say we do. We don't understand mockery. We don't understand contempt. We don't understand what Jesus went through regardless of what we experience in this life. We don't. But Jesus does. And then when you look at verse 12, the Bible teaches us that on that day, Pilate and Herod became friends. Pilate was more interested in being friends with Herod than he was in being friends with Jesus Christ. James would write of Abraham and say that Abraham was the friend of God. That's who I want to be, don't you? I want to be God's friend. How great it would have been if, if Pilate would have wanted to be Jesus' friend as much as he wanted to be Herod's friend, but he was not. Then you've got Jesus back before Pilate. And Jesus is led back before Pilate in verse 11 of chapter 23. Then the Bible teaches us that Pilate and Herod both found no fault. Again, two more times Pilate is going to say, I found no fault in him. Herod found no fault in him. But the crowd still is not satisfied. They're still not pleased. And so what he does is he offers to release Barabbas or Jesus. He puts two men before them. Jesus, an individual who is kind, loving, humble, and helpful. An individual who had spent his entire life going from place to place, healing all of those who were sick, raising the dead. And then you've got Barabbas over here, a rebel. An individual who was an insurrectionist which is literally an individual who caused an uproar, an individual who was guilty of murder. And he says, which one shall I release unto you? And you know what happened. The people cried out, release Barabbas, and you crucify Jesus. And that ended the trials of Jesus. From this point, Jesus would be scourged, and Jesus would be crucified. And that's what we want to talk about in our time together next week. But as we close out this lesson in a closing thought, I want you to I want to remind you of something that, that Pilate said in the book of Matthew, chapter 27 and verse 22. He said to the people, What shall I do with Jesus? You know what the people did with Jesus, don't you? They cried out, crucify him. On the day of judgment, God is going to ask us, what did you do with Jesus? And what we do with Him in this life is dependent upon what we receive in the next life. You've been a great class as you always are, and I truly enjoyed teaching the class. Lord willing, next week we will talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. There's going to be a, a short uh, intermission, and then we will have our announcements and we will enter into our morning worship.
Good morning, everyone. It is so very good to have everyone out this morning, enjoying each other's company and uh, enjoying some good fellowship together. What we want to fellowship together with uh, most of all today is our worship to God. We, uh, we're here to, to give honor and glory to Him and to worship Him. And a uh, good side item of that is we encourage each other, we help each other get to heaven. So we're very thankful that you're here to participate in that. We do have several folks on our prayer list, and we certainly want to remember all of them. Uh, and I will go through some of that list at this point. There is a more complete list in the bulletin. So make sure that you read your bulletin and uh, check that out. There's a whole lot of good information in there, including a more extended uh, list of folks we can pray for. We're glad to have the Payton family back. Make sure that you that you uh, tell them how much we missed them, and uh, we know they had a good trip, and we're very thankful for having them back. In your prayers, continue to remember Marcia Jeffers. She's going to be having surgery uh, toward the end of this month or the 1st of June. Also continue to remember Larry Jones, Levi Abbott, Joni Gary. Uh, talked to Julie this morning, and she said she hadn't had a migraine this week, so she doesn't know if the new medicine she's taking is going to have any ill effects or not. So we're thankful she didn't have any migraines, and, and if she does happen to have one, we sure do hope that this new medication she has is going to help out there. Uh, Tanya's back with us this morning. She's recovering from her surgery. We're very thankful to have her and Jesse here with us uh, this morning. They're able to be back, so keep them in your prayers as well. Also continue to remember Monique Stevenson, Lloyd Wright, Mackenzie Jones, Patty Cowan, uh, Rachel Reed, Linda Payton, Brooke Wilbanks, Stephanie Norton. Uh, we also want to remember Lee and Daniel Holloway. They're out sick this morning, so please keep them in your prayers. Also keep our good sister Ann Busby in your prayers. She fell and hurt her leg and her foot, so please keep her in your prayers. And also add to the prayer list this morning is Colt Moore. Colt is going to be having brain surgery tomorrow. He has some vascular issues, and they've they found some things early, which we're thankful for, and we hope that this surgery goes really well. Uh, lastly, and we've had Walter Stancil on our prayer list for some time now. Uh, he is still on the ventilator, and he is, is doing worse. He's not doing well, and we've been asked to have a special prayer for him this morning. He is, uh, uh, again, not doing very well, and he's still in the hospital. So if you would bow with me at this time, we're going to have a prayer for Walter Stancil uh, specifically. Our great Father in heaven, God of all and knower of all things and keeper of all things, we come before you this morning and we're so thankful for all the blessings that we have. But Father, we, we come before you this morning specifically to, to raise up the name of Walter Stancil. Father, we know that he is in a, a serious physical difficulty and he is, he is struggling for life. Father, we pray for him. We pray for the doctors that are caring for him. That you will bless them with wisdom and, and kindness in their care. Father, please be with Walter's family as they deal with this very difficult situation as well. We especially ask your blessings on Miss Barbara Stansel that she will have faith and comfort in knowing that, that her brothers and sisters in Christ are concerned about her and concerned about Walter, and our prayers go up on their behalf. Father, whatever the situation, we know that, that in our difficulties that we can rely on you and we can lean on you for comfort. Father, we pray that this is the case here. And as we go through our life, Father, help us to always do that and that our difficulties will, will draw us closer to you. Please be with us, Father, through the rest of this service. And again, we, we ask in the name of Jesus that you be with Walter Stansel and with his family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thankful for, for prayer. It is our theme this year, and I'm so thankful that we're able to do that. So uh, appreciate your prayers with us this morning on Walter Stansel's behalf. We would like to again congratulate our 2021 graduates, Latalia Barber and Tristan England, and uh, we're thankful for that. I know they had a good graduation ceremony this weekend. Uh, there are notes on the bulletin board for, the, for this year's graduates, and we're also, next Sunday, going to have a graduation celebration for our 2021 graduates. They'll be recognized during our fellowship meal that we're going to have uh, after worship next Sunday morning, and following that, uh, Sunday morning worship. We're going to have a, a fellowship meal, that celebration of their graduations, and our evening service is going to be an afternoon service at 2 p.m. So next Sunday, come prepared to, to have a good Bible class at 10, a good worship at 11, a good meal 
and celebration right after that worship and hang around for another hour of worship at 2 p.m. and you will, you will be blessed. Just another side announcement, and we'll try to get this in the bulletin. I was talking to Brother Wayne Day this morning, and he says he's got a lot of dogwood bushes and uh, redwood bushes, and if you are interested in having one of those, if you'll see him, he will hook you right up. Those are beautiful trees that bloom well and look pretty, and he's got more than he can handle. So if you'll see Brother Wayne Day, he'll help you out with that. Again, be sure and check the bulletin board for uh, other announcements, and uh, that'll, that'll keep you up to date. That's all that I have this morning. So at the proper time, our scripture reading will be led by Jimmy Dodson, and that's Proverbs chapter 14. If you'd like to go ahead and make a marker there, it'll also be displayed on the overhead. Uh, our opening prayer by Brother Ken McCurry and our closing prayer by Brother Ralph Mann. And with the conclusion of announcements, we'll turn our song service over to Brother J. Edwards. First of all, let me say good morning to everyone. So glad to see you here. May God bless you, bless you, and bless you. We are here to worship God in spirit and truth, and in singing is a part of worship. If you don't sing, the only voice you're going to hear is mine. That might not be too good. So I will, I'm asking everybody to sing and to sing out loud. A verse of a First selection would be Blessed Assurance. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 3. And after that, we'll have our scripture reading. Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Good morning. This scripture reading this morning is from Proverbs 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach 
to any people. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word and bless the one who read. I'll let you lecture to read, I Must Tell Jesus. And after this song, we will have, we will, our prayer will be presented to us. I must tell Jesus, verses 1, 2, and 4. I must tell Jesus. Let's pray together. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day you have blessed us with that we can be here. This first day of the week that we come, that we worship you, that we sing songs to you, that we do those things that you would have us to do to hold up your high and holy name. This song we just sang, Father, how true it is that we must trust Jesus, we must believe in Jesus. For he alone, it is him, Father, in whom we trust. It is you, Father, in whom sent your only begotten Son, that we through him might have the hope of eternal life. And for that, we are so thankful. We ask, Father, that you would forgive us our failures, those things that interfere, those things that would separate us from you, Father, we ask at this time that you would forgive us all of our sins, those things that trouble us, all the troubles of life, Father, from the beginning, there has always been trouble among men. And in this time, in this world, 
as we live day in and day out. We're so thankful for all the many blessings you bless us with, blessings that we are not deserving of, but blessings that you see fit to bestow upon us from day to day, all the things that we enjoy in this life, all the things we enjoy in this country, that we live in a free nation, and we're so thankful for that. But there's trouble, Father, and we know it. Help us, Father, to do those things you would have us to do, that we may be able to overcome all the temptations of life, that we may be able to overcome all the hate, all the animosity that is between people today. May we see each and every person as just a soul, and not just a soul, but a soul that is made by you, and that has an eternal destiny. And may we remember those things as we travel and as we come in day in and day out, that everyone is responsible to you. May we do our part in helping them and shine the light of the gospel to each and every one as we have opportunity. And we pray for those doors of opportunity to be open. We pray, Father, that we would have the insight to see them as they come. Father, we pray for the leaders of this nation. We pray for all of those that are in any form of authority over us. We pray, Father, for them that they may do those things that would be pleasing to you to guide this nation in the way that you would have it to go. Yes, we are, and we remain to be a Christian nation because Christians are here. And we are to do those things that would then show the world that there is a different way of life. There is a way of life that is blessed by you. And we pray, Father, for all of those and for all of that blessings upon us and to help us to know and to do those things that would help in this time of trouble. Father, we're thankful for this congregation. We're thankful for the leadership here. We're thankful for Brother David and his family and what they mean to us. And we pray, Father, your blessings upon each and every one as well as your blessings upon each and every member and everyone present, and even those that are not able to be here. We pray, Father, your blessings upon them. We are thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for your long suffering upon us, that you may guide us in the ways that you would have us to go. May we rely upon your word and your wisdom to guide us in that way. We pray, Father, for conviction of heart that we may continue. We pray, Father, for more faith that we may do those things that you would have us to do and we may help one another along the way. And we pray, Father, for courage that we may live this life, this life that is not all roses, but yet we know in the end there is more than roses that we can be waiting for. We pray, Father, for that day. When that day comes that we leave this earth, that you would receive us unto yourself that we may have that hope while we're here of eternal life. Father, be with all of those that's been mentioned sick, those that are struggling physically as well as spiritually. Pray, Father, for them and all those that care for them, that they may have a restoration of their much-wanted health. We ask, Father, that you would go with us throughout this service. Everything that we say and do here, may it be a praise to your name, bringing your name high and holy above every name. Thank you for all that you do, all that you have done, and all that you will do. And all these things we ask and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother, for that wonderful prayer. May God bless him. Keep on, keep on doing his will. Our next election will be almost persuaded. We were singing the first, first one, verse two, and verse three of that song. And after we sang that song, the Lord's Supper will be presented to us. Almost persuaded. Almost persuaded.
as we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, let's think about what Christ did for us. And to help our minds get to the right point, let's, let's think just a moment. If this morning you were sitting in your seat and you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had chosen you to be a sacrifice for the folks here at Lafayette, and you knew that in not too many days that you were going to be taken and put on trial and that you were going to be beaten and ridiculed and, and die on a cross, how would you feel this morning if you knew that that was coming in your future? Well, Jesus did know this. He knew it before this world was created because he created this world and that plan for our redemption was made before the foundations of the world. Not only did he do it, but he did it on purpose. It wasn't an accident. I'd like for us to read in Mark chapter 8 where we get a little bit of a picture of, of Jesus not only preparing himself, but he was preparing his disciples uh, for what was to come. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, some say. Uh, others say Elias or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man, uh, shall tell no man of him. Listen to verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. We learned this morning in the Bible class that not only was he rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, that he, he was rejected in three separate religious trials and three separate civil trials. Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin all rejected him in, in religious trials. And Pilate, and then Herod, and then Pilate again, rejected him in civil trials. The whole nation rejected him. And Jesus knew this was going to happen. He was preparing himself and he was preparing his disciples for it also. Let's read in Mark chapter 15 a little bit about what happened there toward the end. Mark 15 beginning in verse 9. But Pilate answered them saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowing their knees worshipped him. And it was the third hour and they crucified him. I'm so thankful that that I'm not the one that, that is either able or, or willing, truth be known, to, to be this sacrifice for the whole world. But Jesus was. And it was a willing sacrifice and a knowing sacrifice. And he was almighty, had all power. He was part of the Godhead. He could have called ten legions of angels and destroyed everything. But for me and you, he chose to suffer the spitting and the crucifixion, the, the shame, and he did that for us. So let's keep these thoughts in our mind as we partake of the bread and as we partake of the cup. The bread telling us that it's Jesus' body. He left the perfection of heaven, that perfect body that feels no pain. He left that to come down and feel pain, to be a human like us. And then he gave his life, his blood, uh, to pay the price for, for sins that we've committed. Let's give thanks to God for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we come before you so thankful this morning that, that Jesus is willing to suffer for us. Father, we're thankful that he took on a fleshly body and that he suffered many things on our behalf. Father, we thank you for this bread that reminds us of that death and 
and that sacrifice He made for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Likewise, we think about Jesus' blood, his life, blood that he gave for us and for our sins. Let's give thanks also for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for the blood of Christ, the blood of the only perfect lamb that could, that could permanently pay the price for all the sins of all time. Father, we're thankful that, that you have given us a way to have access to that blood through obedience to your gospel. And as we remember Christ's blood this morning, we again give you so many thanks that, that he was willing to die for us. And this prayer we ask in his name. Amen. That completes our observance of the Lord's Supper. Because of Christ's great sacrifice, though, we also have another opportunity this morning. We have an opportunity to give back. We've all been blessed so very much in so many different ways. And uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 11 gives us some instruction on how we're to look at that. Oh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We have an opportunity this morning to do what we hopefully have already purposed in our heart so that we can give, not because we have to, not because of necessity, but that we can give cheerfully. Maybe one day David, uh, who has studied the Greek more than me, can, can talk a little bit more about that word cheerful. But the Greek word that that word cheerful comes from means is the same word we get the word hilarious from. I think it's hilarious, something like that. Uh, so when you give back, it should be so joyful that you just almost want to laugh out loud at how great it is to be able to give back to God. So think about that. Uh, there are two collection plates in the back. You have the opportunity to, to put some there, and our good elders make good use of that. It's very easy to give back to God when you know you have a, a group of men that are that are going to uh, dutifully take care of that money and make sure that it's used for that building of God's kingdom. If you would, please pray with me as we, as we ask a blessing on our giving. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the many blessings that we have. You have given us so much, Father, and you have put us in responsibility of so much. And we pray that you'll give us wisdom, that we'll, we'll use the, the things that you've given us, be good stewards of all that we have, and Father, that as we give back this morning, that we will do so cheerfully and that we will do so with love in our hearts for you and for those around us. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank Brother Jesse for presenting us with the Lord. Supper, may God bless him to keep on keeping on doing God's will. Our invitation song this morning will be Softly and Tender, Softly and Tender. We will sing that song after our preaching, which will be our invitation song. But the song that we will sing before Brother David coming for us will be I Love My Savior 2. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3. I Love My Savior 2. And after we sing this song, the next voice we hear will be from Brother David. And what I want you guys to do is stand up on this song because I want us to sing. I love my Savior. You know, if you love somebody, you say, I love you. That's what I want you to sing. You tell Jesus how we love him. I love my Savior too. Jesus, my heavenly King, love me. I
Good morning. It is so great to be here and uh, so great to see everyone out and been waiting a whole week to say this. Couldn't think of a better place and all the world to be than right here with the good folks of Lafayette Church of Christ. And uh, what, what a great service we have had thus far this morning. Uh, Bible classes and the Lord's Supper and Brother J.L. leading us in that great singing. Uh, Brother Jesse leading us in a great devotion. You know, one of the many things that I appreciate about this congregation, and many congregations when the Lord's Supper is observed, they just come to that part and they uh, observe it and then that's it. But uh, we have always sought to set the mind and prepare ourselves for that great event. And I really appreciate these good elders for always wanting to do that. And, and the good men who always get up here and, and direct our thoughts uh, toward the Lord's Supper and the meaningfulness of it. Righteousness. It is a word that appears many, many times in the Bible. Did you know that the word righteous itself appears some 276 times in the Bible? The word righteousness, which is very kin to righteous, appears some 238 times. For a grand total, if I did the right math, 514 times that the word righteous or righteousness in some form is found in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, if the word was there one time, you would recognize that it would be important because it's a word that God inspired His writer to write and have them put it within the pages of God's holy writ. But a word that appears 514 times. In the Old Testament it was a theme. In the New Testament is a theme. Don't we recognize the clear fact that righteousness is something that God thinks is greatly important? And in fact, it is so important that you and I can't go to heaven if we are not righteous. If you remember in the teaching of the book of Matthew chapter 25 in verse 46, the Bible says the righteous shall go into eternal life. If we are not righteous, then eternal life, heaven, cannot be my home. If righteousness is such an important thing, we not only need to be those people who we strive to be righteous, but if there's something we ought to be praying about this year, and not just this year, but every year, and every day of our lives is for righteousness. Did you hear the verse that, that Brother Jim read for us? Righteousness, what does it do? It exalts a nation. If we want this nation to be exalted, if we want this nation to be the kind of nation that God wants it to be, what do we need to be doing? Folks, we need to be praying for righteousness. You think about our theme this year. Our theme is praying through 2021. And there are many things that we need to pray for. But brothers and sisters in Christ, if there's one thing that we ought to ask God for every day is to help the church be righteous people so that we can show other people about righteousness. And so that's what I want us to think about in our time together this morning. I want us to think about Praying for righteousness. And as we think about righteousness and recognize the different parts and principles concerning righteousness, I want us to think about several different things. First of all, I want us to begin with a description. When you see this word some 514 times in the Bible, whether it be in the Old Testament or whether it be in the New Testament, what does it mean when you come across that word? Let's begin first of all as we think about the description of of righteousness by recognizing that whether it be in the Old Testament or whether it be in the New Testament, it has the basic same definition. That's one of the things that I love about this word. A lot of times when you're studying a word or you're doing a word study, the definition will vary from testament to testament or covenant to covenant. But this particular word, it's the same. Whether it be in the Old or the New Testament, the word righteous literally remains a pronouncement of innocence. Now what does that mean to you? I need to understand, first of all, who's doing the pronouncement. The one who's doing the pronouncement is none other than God. Innocence. 
Righteous, when an individual is righteous, if I'm righteous, if you're righteous, that means that God has pronounced us innocent. Innocent of what? Innocent of the one thing that will condemn us on the day of judgment. And that's none other than sin. And so when we are righteous, do you understand that you are an individual who if God were standing right here, He could turn and say, Dale is righteous. He's pronounced as being innocent. He could turn and say, Jesse is righteous. And all throughout this congregation, if we are righteous, God could stand and say, that person is innocent. That individual is acceptable to me. That's what it means to be righteous. And folks, I'm thankful to be able to stand before you, not with pride, but with dignity, and say, I'm righteous. And I'm thankful to be able to stand before a group of people that I'm privileged to speak to each Lord's Day and to know that they are righteous. We are righteous people. But what about the word righteousness? The word righteousness literally refers to the act of doing what agrees with God's standards. We are made righteous when we do what this book says. Righteousness is continuing to live in a way that is acceptable to God. And how do we do that? Well, in Psalm chapter 119, verse 172, the Bible says, Thy commandments are righteousness. So if we want to keep on being righteous, you know what we've got to do? We've got to keep God's commandments. Isn't that simple and easy? If I want to be righteous, I do what God says. If I want to keep on being righteous, I keep on doing what God says. I've just got to go back to this book and I can be righteous. But in the second place, when we think about the word righteous or righteousness, I want us to consider, if you will, the desire. Now, most of the time when we think about the word desire, we might immediately begin to think about our desire to be righteous. And, and, and that's well needed. In fact, you'll never be righteous. I'll never be righteous. None of us will be righteous until we conclude and we have that desire within us. I want to be righteous. I want to be in a right relationship with God. That's why Jesus would say, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see that craving? You see that desire there? Just like you would hunger and you would thirst for food and drink. We are to treat righteousness in that same manner. And the blessing in this passage, Jesus says what's going to happen. When we seek it, when we desire it, we're going to be filled because we're going to do the things necessary so that you and I can be righteous. So we understand that there is a desire on our part. But do you ever stop to think about the fact that God wants you and I to be righteous? That's His desire. It is. In fact, there are so many passages of Scripture where you can see this. For example, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, the Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Note that God says, seek ye first. Why does He do that? Because He wants us to seek righteousness. He wants us to be righteous in this life that we live. Think about Psalm chapter 106 and verse 3. Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. God says there is a blessing upon those who are righteous. Those who are living their lives in accordance with God's will. And so when I think about the desire of righteousness, yes, I have to desire it. But at the same time, I must recognize that God desires that you and I be righteous. In the third place, as we think about the word righteous or righteousness, I think it's important that we stop and reflect upon the fact that it is a demand. Yes, righteousness is a desire. It's something that you and I must have within us. Yes, it's something that God wants us to have. But I have to understand that it's something also that He commands that I have. It's, it's not something that, you know, it just, you know, if I want to, yeah, but if I don't want to, that's okay. It's something that God demands of you and me. And you can see that throughout the Scripture. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, flee also youthful lust, but pursue. Now there's a number of different things that God says here in this passage that you and I are to pursue, that we are literally to chase after, to run down and catch. But the very first thing that He says that we are to run down and catch in this life is righteousness. And 
Again, what is righteousness? Righteousness is living according to the commandments of God. Living our lives by His standard. That, that's something that God's commanding. This is an imperative. It's not an option. It's something that God expects of you and me. Again, in Romans 6 and verse 13, but do not present yourself, your members, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Your members in this particular passage of Scripture is clearly talking about your body, your life. You and I are to use our lives as an instrument of righteousness. And I love that word instrument. It literally means a tool. So when it comes to righteousness, you and I are to use our lives as a tool of righteousness. It doesn't stop there. Consider, if you will, Romans 6 and verse 19, where in the Bible it teaches us that we are to present our members as slaves of righteousness. And you think of that word slave, literally a servant to righteousness. Everything that you and I do in this life, it is to be committed to righteousness. Oh, and I love this one. Psalm 132 and verse 9. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. What are you? You're a priest. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9, you are a royal priesthood. And the Bible says that we are to be clothed with righteousness. We understand that. Just like I am clothed with this suit and this tie and this shirt, you and I are to be clothed with good things, with good doing, living our lives in accordance to God's pattern. And I love this one. This is one of my absolute favorite. Amos 5 and verse 24. But let justice run down like water and watch it and righteousness like a mighty stream. When we were in Yellowstone, we had the opportunity to go and to view the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. And I have never seen a river roll over a cliff and go into the bottom. And, and I was standing there thinking, my, what power as that river hit the bottom of that canyon and the water just sprayed way up into the air. I thought to myself, that's the way that righteousness should be with you and me. Everywhere we go, we should just be literally a river of righteousness gushing out of the lives that we live so that when people see you and me, they can glorify our God in heaven who is living because we are living our lives by righteousness. And so when we think about righteousness, yes, it's a desire. But brothers and sisters, it's a demand. It's something that God demands that we have in our lives. In the fourth place, I want us to consider the demonstration of righteousness. Now someone might say, well, why do you want to do that? Because even though we have these verses in the Bible, that teach that you and I must desire to be righteous, that God desires us to be righteous, that God demands us to be righteous. There are those who have concluded we can't be righteous. There's no way. You see, our lives are just so filled with sin. In fact, really and truly, you're born in sin. Someone who is born a sinner, there's no way you can be righteous. And, and there is a word for that idea that you can't be righteous. If you're taking notes, I'll spell it. B-O-L-O-G-N-A. Now I know that's bologna, but we call it bologna in the South. Okay? The Bible does not teach that you and I cannot be righteous. The Bible teaches that we can be righteous. Why would you have all of these verses in the Bible where the Bible says that we are to desire righteousness and, and God wants us to be righteous and He demands us to be righteous? Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible teaches us this is the commandment of God, that we, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. In other words, they are not beyond our ability to keep. I believe that's 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5. But I need to believe with all my heart that I can be righteous. How can I know that? Because there are people in the Bible who are said to be righteous. I want to just call your attention to two examples. Number one, in the book of Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, the Bible speaks of a man by the name of Zacharias, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. And I want you to look at what the Bible says plainly. And they were both, what? What were they both? They were righteous before God. Now folks, either the Bible is true or it is a lie. 
The Bible says that both these men, this man and this woman, they were righteous before God. And that's not the only example. Just consider one other with me. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. The Bible teaches us that Abel was righteous. There's Zechariah, there's Elizabeth, and there's Abel. They were righteous. And we could go on and on this morning naming righteous people in the Bible. Let me ask you a question. What's the difference between these people we have looked at and you and me? Nothing. They were human beings. They just lived in a different time from you and me. They were individuals who loved God. They were individuals who wanted to obey God, to please God. They were individuals who were righteous. And when you and I live by the same pattern, which is God's Word, please tell me what we're going to be. We're going to be righteous. You've got to believe that you can be righteous and that you are righteous if you've been obedient to the Gospel. We will never be able to convince a world who is living in unrighteousness, that they can be righteous. If you and I are not convicted of it, brothers and sisters, we can be righteous. And with that thought in mind, I want you to consider the depth of righteousness. How righteous can you and I be? Well, let's let the Bible read it. Let's let the Bible speak. In the book of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Don't let anyone tell you you can't be righteous. John says you can only be righteous, but look at the depth of righteousness. He who practices righteousness. You live your life by this book that you've got in your lap or in your hands. He is righteous. Do, do you see it? Do you see it? Let it sink in just as He is righteous. Tell me who the He is. Who is it, brothers and sisters? It's Jesus Christ. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not. But I am. Because Jesus has declared it. God has declared me innocent. God has declared me righteous. God has declared you righteous. How righteous? Just as Jesus is righteous. As long as we follow the message within this book, and folks, as they say in a court scene, case closed. What, what else do we need to know? We are individuals who can be righteous. If we have the desire and we follow the command and we see those who are righteous and we recognize the depth of righteousness, the only thing that's left is the development of righteousness. How is it that I become righteous? And I want to call your attention to a passage of Scripture in the Bible in order to i be able to see this. I want you to go to Philippians chapter 3 with me. I want you to go to Philippians chapter 3. And as we think about righteousness, I want you to begin to understand what righteousness is not about. Number one, it is not about the physical. Look at verse 5. Paul says, we're really beginning in verse 4. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more also. I have more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. What is Paul talking about when he speaks of all of those different things? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrew. Folks, he was a full-blooded Jew. He was a Jew who was circumcised the eighth day. That was the law that the Jews followed. He was from Israel. In other words, he could trace his descendants all the way back through Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, which was a part of the Israelites. And look at this one. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Both his mother and his father were direct descendants. That didn't make him righteous. Nothing physical made him righteous. Same way today. Just because your mama and daddy and your grandmother and grandfather and everyone on down the line are righteous, that doesn't make you righteous. It doesn't. I mean, you just stop and think about it. You can go into an operating room and just because of the fact that you're in an operating room, that doesn't make you a surgeon, does it? Absolutely not. And just being in a family does not make you 
righteous. It's not a physical family thing. It's not about devoutness. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 he says, concerning, or latter part of verse 5, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Uh, who was a Pharisee? A Pharisee was a most religious individual. I know that the Bible teaches us, uh, gives us a bad view of them, but when you stop and think about it, a, 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 sad, a Pharisee was an extremely religious individual. I mean, they were strict when it came to keeping the law. But they're extremists when it came to religion. That didn't make them righteous, did it? No, because Jesus would say to His disciples, unless your righteousness is, exceeds or goes above that of the Pharisees, you won't have heaven as your home. And so just being devout, just being religious, coming to church on Sunday and, and coming to Bible class and taking the Lord's Supper and just putting money, that doesn't make an individual religious. Neither does sincerity. Look at verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. You know, in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, Paul would say, I did all things in good conscience before God. What does that mean? In other words, when he persecuted the church, he was very sincere. He thought what he was doing was right. But sincerity did not make him righteous, did it? Absolutely not. Perfection did not make him righteous. Look at verse 6. Persecuted the church concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You remember that young ruler who comes running to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes through the law and that young man goes through the law and, or Jesus goes through the law and the young man said, all of these I've done from my youth up. Do you realize that's exactly what Paul is saying right here? Paul is saying concerning the law, blameless. I mean, I have kept it perfectly. Did it make him righteous? No. In keeping the law, dotting every I and crossing every T. Though God demands us to follow His Word, that's not what makes us righteous. What then does make us righteous? What is righteousness all about? Brothers and sisters, it's all about Jesus. It is. Look at what He says beginning in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost for who? For Christ Jesus, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may win Christ. Now here's, here's what righteousness is about. Look at verse 9. It's about being in Christ and being found where? In Him. Why? Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. My righteousness is not about me. It's about where I am. And that's in Christ Jesus. How do you get into Christ Jesus? The only way you can get into Christ Jesus is through the act of baptism. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. When I was baptized, I was placed in Him. When you were baptized, you were placed in Him. And that's what makes you righteous. And it's not just about being in Christ. It's also important that I understand it's about knowing Christ. Look at verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. If I'm going to be righteous, it's not enough just to be in Christ. It's not enough just to go through the motions and to be baptized and say, okay, I'm in Christ. It's a life where I know Him. And I want you to look at that word know. That is a growing knowledge. It's a knowledge where I know more and more and more. And the way you can come to that conclusion, think about the individual who made this statement. Who was it? It was the Apostle Paul. If there was anyone who you could ever say knew Christ, wouldn't you say it was Paul? And yet what is his conclusion? I want to know him. I want to know more about him. More and more and more about him. And likewise, if you and I are going to be righteous, we're not satisfied with the knowledge that we have of Him. I want to know more and more and more and more about Him. And when I live my life that way in Christ Jesus and every day striving to improve my knowledge of Christ Jesus, folks, I'm not only going to be righteous, but I'm going to remain righteous. Now what's the importance of all of this? 
In James 5, 16, which is one of our theme verses, it should be on the, the billboard back behind you. I want you to note that the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. We need to be people if we want this world to be righteous. Remember, righteousness exalts a nation. If we want this world to be righteous, then you and I as righteous servants, righteous servants we need to pray for righteousness and we need to live righteous lives. And when we pray and we live and we teach people how to be righteous, what are we going to have, brothers and sisters? We're going to have a righteous nation and righteousness will exalt this nation. You know, that's the trouble with this world today. It's not righteous. But you and I can change it through our prayers and through our actions. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, I love you with all my heart. But you're not righteous. You're not right with the Lord. You've got to become a child of God. You've got to be obedient to the gospel. Come believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of sins and take those steps. And you leave here this morning a righteous person praying for righteousness and helping other people to see what they need to do in order to become righteous. Maybe you're hearing you're already a child of God and and your life is not right. Maybe there are some things there that you need to change. Whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? All in for you.
thank Brother Dave for that wonderful message he presented to us. May God bless him to keep on keeping on doing his will the best of his ability. Thank God for him. Our next election will be, which will be our dismissal. Uh, let me get the right one. It is well with my soul. We were saying verses 1 and 3. Are there any more announcements that need to be made? I would like to be made at this time. So let me know. Also keep in mind that the evening service, David will be preaching again. Another good sermon. I'll be singing good songs. So we ask you to come back. Enjoy the preaching. Enjoy the singing. And show Jesus that it's not about us, it's about him. How much we appreciate him. It was, you know, it would be amazing if somebody would just sit down with you and just tell you the thing that Jesus had made possible. Possible for Jesus. Well, now I'm going to say, you know, you know, that's what it is. That's what Kevin Harlow, he would sit down and tell you. It would be so great. But that's how we got to think about it. We got to love what we're doing. We got to love to go to heaven. We have to love. And when we're not love, we show that. We show that. So I'm asking everyone that's here, please come back this evening if you can. If you can't, everybody understand that. We were saying our last song, verses, verses 1 and 3, and after that, we'll have our dismissal prayer. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river in my way, when sorrow like sea child of thine that we can say it is well with my soul. Father, thank you so much that it has been right for us to be here today. Thank you, Father, for giving us the command to be here. Father, you know that we 
need the fellowship of each other to strengthen us. And Father, as our Lord died on that cruel cross, on the night before, he gave us a memorial service. And Father, that we can do that on the first day of each week, that we can remember the suffering and the pain that he went through that can make us righteous, Father, that we have the Bible, the truth. Father, there's so much misinformation in this world, so much lying, Father, but we know that as we hold our holy word in our hands and read it and study it, that we can hang on to the truths that are therein. And Father, thank you so much for that. Thank you for the church here at Lafayette. Thank you for our good elders who have seen us through this terrible year of the past, Father. And as things seem to be easing up, we're so thankful for their spiritual guidance during the time that uh, we were not able to come together as we have this morning. And Father, as they gently brought us back through the study of thy word and through their humbleness and their guidance, Father, we're so thankful. We're thankful for David, Father, and the study that he has presented to us today about being righteous. Not that we're haughty, Father, but we're humble. And Father, help us to teach others. Thank you, Father, for this memorial service and for this day. Bless us and keep us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>